Barry Rose was appointed organist of the New Guildford Cathedral last week, which is quite a thing, for he's only 25. So far, he's been organist of St Andrew's Kingsbury. He's got something he wants to say to Christian Outlook and listeners each week this month about the boys' choir he's built up in his present church and about the anthems they sing there. As the organist and choir master of a parish church and a regular listener to Christian Outlook, I've always had a special interest in the musical items included in the programme. And informative and interesting as these have been, I felt a lack of practical help to people like me because each of the programmes was illustrated by the choir of an established choral foundation, boys with choral scholarships and professional adult singers. Most of us haven't these advantages, and the anthems I shall be illustrating during these four talks should be within the reach of the boys of an ordinary parish church choir. St Andrew's Kingsbury is a northwest London suburban church without a paid choir, and we find difficulty in getting local singers for the underparts. What we do is to have about eight picked musicians who travel from long distances away and can only get to the evening service on Sundays. You won't be hearing them in this series, but in the last two years, I've got together a choir of boys from the neighborhood who are prepared to practice nearly every evening of the week. We've got 16 boys in the choir and seven probationers. They won't mind my saying that they're very ordinary boys, such as you might find in any parish. But given enough practice, they can be brought, they can even enjoy being brought, to the standard of being able to sing the treble part with expert musicians. And of course, on Sunday mornings, they're all the choir we have for the two services. That's why I've had to take a special interest in anthems for treble voices only. I want to tell you something about the details of our practices as we go along, so I haven't much time to tell you about tonight's anthem but the producer of Christian Outlook had a midget tape recorder with him when he came to a practice in our vestry a few weeks ago. And here I am telling the boys about our first anthem. By the way, the translation in which we sing it is God liveth a, and not God liveth still, as you'll see in the Radio Times. It's a chorale, really. It's, a, it's rather like a hymn. The effect depends upon the word that you put over, because there are two verses of which the music is exactly the same for each verse. So you must start joyfully with God liveth a, and how can fear thy heart dismay? And please, the man who's edited it, that is the man who's put it into modern notation, has put a lot of expression marks in, and they're all quite sensible, and we'll take notice of them the whole way through. And please make the thing joyful, we'll have an introduction. We'll have the last line as the introduction. Yes? Is this the first time such a music been in operation? I don't think so. No, I'm sure it isn't. No, it's just one of the many, um, songs that Bart wrote, that was all. He wrote them for single voice. This happens to be arranged for four voices, but we're going to sing it as a treble voice anthem. Right, after the introduction, please. You'll be hearing the whole anthem in a minute, but I'd just like you to hear these little important points about consonants from our final practice before the recording in church. Incidentally, we're singing it in the right key this time, a semitone higher. Yes, now man forget not night and the day. What about the and day? Why has that become difficult? Two D. Two D. How do you get over it? It's a slight er sound. Slight er sound. Night and day. All the people want to hear is night and day. They want to hear two Ds. Do that, please. Man forgets not night and day. Right now, watch for the cross, please. <laughs> words are lift to God. Two T's this time, lift to God. They've got here both T's. Sing lift to God, please, without the piano. All right. Lift to God, yes. Now the note on the word is, what do they 
danger there? Anybody think of any danger? That's not, what? Yes, because it's B natural and you've been singing B flat all the way along the previous line. So you sharpen that note, please. It's a leading note into the key of C. That's a note to get in tune. Do lift to God again. Here's the final performance. And we listen to the boys of St Andrew's Parish Church, Kingsbury, practising an anthem for treble voices called Oh, turn away mine eyes, lest they behold vanity. But there's one unusual feature this time. Barry Rose, who is St Andrew's choirmaster, and who will become organist at Guildford Cathedral in September, is in the studio with a chance to comment on the rehearsal as it proceeds. Barry Rose. I hope I convinced you last week that some of Bach's music, which is more often performed in four parts, can be used quite acceptably as treble unison anthems with organ accompaniment. A great many of his sacred songs have been translated into English and are useful to have in your repertoire. The restoration of the monarchy in England brought a great revival of our own English church music. Boyce and Purcell in particular set great passages of scripture to music dividing them into movements for solo voices, duets, trios, choruses, and so on. Although some of these great anthems are too ambitious for the ordinary parish church choir, 
single movements from them often stand quite well on their own. Tonight's item, Boyce's setting of words from Psalm 119, O turn away mine eyes, lest they behold a vanity, is in fact an aria from such an anthem. The music is in the typical rhythmic style of the period, almost a minuet and very tuneful. In any boys' choir, there will be a good many boys who are not able to read music, so it's always a help to have an attractive, tuneful melody, so much easier to learn. We will assume that the choir has learnt the basic essentials of the anthem and can sing the notes correctly, but once again we'll listen to part of the final practice. that is that the words are lest they behold. Now anybody listening at the moment would think it was less they behold. It's lest they behold. And you sing on a vowel sound the whole time in, in music up to the last second when you put your consonants in. And not only must the S be there but the T must be there as well. Not lest they behold but lest they behold. Lest they behold. Go from bottom of the page please where you pick up with lest. Now you that I may fear ear thee. You sing it on a different ear sound. That I may fear thee, it follows. Let's do that, please. O establish thy word, it is, not ward. O establish thy word in thy servant. Servant, spelt servant, pronounced servant, servant. Let's try, please, O establish. That point about servant may seem trivial, but I found it necessary to put it right every time we've sung this anthem. And now let's skip to the final rallentando, which brings up the whole problem of keeping choir and organ together. Start at the end. Uh, just at the end of fear. Then. Yes. Here. <laughs> it's slowing up all the time. Then go from the last bit established, please. It is established. <coughs> Nothing else will do. Two beats, second line down. One, two. expect the scene together when you don't look. It's impossible. Let's just do that last bit again, please, that I may fear thee. After two and a half beats. One, two, one. Yeah, the first word, that, please. One, two, one. Two boys weren't looking. What should they have been looking at? Our organ and console at St Andrews are in the West Gallery and the choir stalls in the chancel with the whole church between us. So I always have the leaders on each side of the choir conducting. And I don't mean just wagging their fingers in time with the organ to keep the choir together. They actually set the time and I follow them. 
Where you can get boys with enough musical sense to do this, it means that the choir as a whole ceases to be solely dependent on the organ. I think you'll agree that the leaders were handling that relentando quite skillfully, though two boys let them down by not looking. Anyway, it's time we heard the performance. As a contrast to the last two unison anthems by, by Bach and Boyce, I'm going on this week to an anthem by a relatively modern composer, Percy Buck. He published this work with Novellos in 1918. Though the words are the collect for Sexagesima Sunday, it's an anthem which can be used at any time. It's the first occasion in this series that we've had the voices dividing into parts, and I want to say a word about how I set about this with the boys at Kingsbury. You'll remember my saying that there are sure to be boys in any parish church choir who can't read music. Where there's a tuneful melody, they'll pick it up quite quickly and accurately by ear. But I'm afraid this only applies to the top line of the music. When you have a piece of music with a second treble part, which crosses the first treble, or else which always stays below it, if you try to teach it by playing it over to the full choir, you'll find that the boys who learn by ear always make for the top part. One way round this might be to put all the readers onto the second treble line, but that won't do. You'd have no real musicians left on your top line. So I divided my 16 boys equally, and when we were singing in two parts, I made each choir learn its part separately out of earshot of the other part. One half of the choir practised in the vestry and the other in the church. And this is where I should mention that I've encouraged and guided my head chorister who, incidentally, is only 13, so that he is able, very competently, to take a full practice, or to take, as in this case, half the choir in the vestry. After starting two-part anthems in this way, I think I can say that this method is becoming unnecessary at St Andrews, because the boys have gradually acquired enough musical sense to pick out and hold a lower part. But it's some time before that happens, and I'm sure this is the best way to start. Reading music is another thing which comes gradually. I always try to encourage it by going through some of the intervals and note values at the beginning of each practice. Now let's just go through quickly a few of the note values so we can get on with it. The length of God is, is what? Four beats. Four beats. Four beats. What time are we in? Three two. Meaning? Three minims. Three minims in a bar. Therefore the D of God comes where if it's four beats long? Where? Yeah. On the end of the fourth beat. Who seest that we put? If we're counting in minions, what's the length of the crotchet then? A half. A half. It's half a beat. Let's try the chorus part, please. That's on page three. Chorus part after one bar and one beat. <coughs> Then 
we go and sing another one. There it is. The whole effect of this anthem lies in the way that its long, flexible musical phrases exactly match the cadence of the words. Who seest that we put not our trust in anything that we do. I had to go over that phrase again and again to get the slight crescendo rising steadily up to the top note. And whatever the quality of your own voice, don't be afraid to show boys how you want the music phrased. They're natural mimics. And now we'll go on to the place where the music divides. you're going to arrive at the end together please you must count you must look it's the same every week there I am telling them to look not unless everybody pays attention can we be sure of a perfect finish the two leaders close their fingers to indicate a slight hum on the final N of our men but it's no good unless everybody watches them by the way the boy I chose to sing the solo and it's not as easy as you might think is only 11 if you haven't a suitable soloist for the first verse, you can use a semi-chorus. What matters is that there should be a marked contrast between the two sections of this anthem. Well, here's the result of all the practice we put in.
Larry Rose, choir master of St Andrew's Church, Kingsbury, again shows us what wonderful results can be obtained with ordinary boys from the parish. I asked Barry how often these boys practice together. I had in mind the normal free church choir, where members can only spare one night per week for rehearsal, and hardly that. He will tell you later what rehearsing the Kingsbury boys do. Their enthusiasm deserves the good results you hear. Once again, Barry Rose will comment on his own choir practice. Last week we took an anthem for boys' voices from this century, and there are a number of recent or living church musicians who have composed anthems or settings especially for trebles. The late Sir Sidney Nicholson, Dr F. W. Wadeley of Carlisle Cathedral, Bernard Rose of Magdalen College, Oxford, among others. The one I'm taking tonight is by Leonard Blake, a present director of music at Morven College. He's written several attractive treble anthems and a setting of the evening canticles. He wrote this anthem in 1934 for the boys of a prep school where he was teaching. It's a setting of Isaac Watt's evening hymn, and now another day is gone. The melody is tuneful and easy to learn. It's repeated in each of the three verses and is climaxed at the end of the last verse by a short but very effective division of the voices into two parts. Always, but especially when a tune repeats, it's essential to pay great attention to the words. I've applied this by all I've said about vowels and consonants the last three weeks. But the boys must know more than the sound of the words. They must know what they mean. It's always wise to make them read the words aloud before singing them. If they can't say the words properly, they'll never convey the sense when they sing them. In each verse of this anthem, the last two lines run on, and ideally should be sung in one breath. If your boys can't manage this, you can make the choir stagger their breathing, and thus get a continuous sound all the time. Whatever happens, there mustn't be a gap at the end of the third line. I want you to hear how we set about this problem of words. Read them in the right sense, Garrett. Watch no, that isn't the sense. That's not the sense at all. Read them in the right sense. Enthusiasm of darkness. Keep the watch around my bed. That's it. And through the hours of darkness, keep their watch around my bed. Sing that, please. And through. <laughs> Cheerful heart, and he means you to be cheerful about it. So let's be cheerful. Says Mezzo Forte, last verse. like this. Love. V. V. On the end. In thy love, please. Each week so far we've listened to so much choir practice and singing that I haven't had time to make many general points. I suppose one of the greatest gifts a choir master can have is the ability to instill into children who are not musically inclined a sense of enthusiasm and a love of music. When I first came to Kingsbury and started to build the choir two and a half years ago, there were two choir practices of an hour each week. Gradually the boys became keener and began to take a real interest so that now each chorister attends two practices of an hour and a half and one of an hour during the week as well as two three-quarter hour, one half hour and one quarter hour practice on Sundays, and of course the three services themselves. I feel sure that enthusiasm is the greatest factor in making a parish church choir, and if the boys see that your own enthusiasm is unbounded, then they will react in the same way. Remember that the mood and attitude of the choir master will be reflected in the way his boys sing and behave in church. Of course, like any other choir, we have our attendance problems, though usually not the fault of the boys themselves. There are homework problems, five of the boys are at grammar schools, and the minor personal problems. 
when you have 16 boys from 10 different schools, there are bound to be differences of temperament and background, and it isn't always easy to keep a united team spirit. I think I ought to repeat the fact that we have no selected musical talent at St Andrews, but just local boys who are prepared to work hard. Of our 16 choristers, eight study the piano and another is now learning harmony. This, I might add, is a great help. The boys who learn an instrument are always able to pick up new music much quicker than the others. An awful lot of time can be wasted at choir practices by stopping to correct mistakes. To save some of this, I have a system, it's not original, that any boy who knows he's made a mistake puts his hand up, so I don't have to stop and find out who's going wrong. Perhaps you'd like some idea of how we divide the time between the various things that need practising. On Tuesdays, we give about a quarter of an hour to voice production and exercises, probably about 40 minutes to next Sunday's psalms, an average of three each Sunday, and that leaves just over half an hour for the anthems, which need preparing well ahead. You'll find that boys won't mind working at the psalms once they realise how they should be sung, and there's no better way of achieving this than to take your choir to one of the great cathedrals or college chapels where the psalms are well sung each day. Altogether, it's a happy business, but it's time I said goodbye and let you listen to our performance And Now Another Day Is Gone by Leonard Blake.